to talk about rotational atherectomy and mainly focus uh, on advanced technical tips, mainly those 12 technical tips, including in comparison with orbital atherectomy and a brief on orbital atherectomy. Those tips will be useful for advanced operators and fellows, but I do also want to provide some basics for the less experienced fellows. So I will start with this. This is the rotablator system. There are three major components. You have the burr, which is connected to this advancer system, which is connected to a console. This is the rotablator burr. It has diamond chips only on its front end. It doesn't have chips on the back end. So the burr only cuts forward. It doesn't cut backward. And that burr shaft is inside a Teflon sheath, which protects the coronary from the spinning of that drive shaft, and it allows delivery of a glide solution. The burr is advanced through the Teflon sheath using that advancer knob. On the advancer, you have this rotablator knob. The knob has two functions. You can unscrew it this way in order to be able to advance the bar and you push on it to activate the rotablator bar. The rotablation is activated by pushing on this knob and the rotablation remains active until you deactivate it by pushing on it again. You don't need to keep the push on it. It just, you push on it, it gets active. You push again, it gets inactive. And see how you can lock the knob in place two centimeters from the back of the advancer, which is, you know, one to two fingers. You have to lock that knob when you're advancing the whole system over the wire. You unlock it only when you want to rotablate and, ad and advance the bar. Every time you want to advance the whole system, your knob should be locked. It is unlocked only during active rotablation. Other knobs on the advancer are the brake defeat knob, which I will explain a little later, and the Dynaglide buttons. Dynaglide allows you to activate the burr at lower speeds. You can advance the whole system inside the guide and inside the coronary with no or limited injury while you are on the Dynaglide system. And you can remove the burr through the guide and sometimes through the coronary while on Dynaglide which allows smooth, slippery removal with less friction. Dynaglide speed is 70,000 versus the rotablation speed is usually set at around 140 to 160,000. So this is much lower speed, which allows a slippery advancement and slippery removal of the system through the coronary and through the guide catheter. When you're advancing on Dynaglide, you have to have your burr locked. In order to enable Dynaglide, you push that button here, and then you can activate it by pushing this button, which will activate it intermittently for as long as you're pushing it, or you can activate it by pushing the rotablator knob button, which will keep it in Dynaglide until you push it again. This is an illustration of how to perform rotablation. We unscrew the knob, we push the button, then we advance a slow in, fast out, slow in, fast backward. And we keep our runs at 10 to 15 seconds, short runs, and we give a break of approximately one minute, one to two minutes between runs. You set up the rotablator speed at 140 to 160,000 RPM. Higher speeds have not achieved more cutting based on one study, but they were still shown to be safe based on another study. So if you need to use higher speed for a lesion that you cannot cross, you may up to 180,000. But the classic is to use 140 to 160,000 RPMs. Now, this is how you activate the Dynaglide system. You push the Dyna button, then you defeat the wire break, then you can activate it either, either intermittently via this button or persistently via that knob button. Once you've pushed the Dynaglide here to enable it, 
when you push the knob button, it will go into Dynaglight system, not Rotablator 140,000 system. So you push this, then you activate intermittently via that or persistently via this until you push it again, this one, and it will stop the Dynaglight. But if you're planning on advancing or removing the system on Dynaglide, you have to break defeat the wire by pushing this button before you activate Dynaglide. Now, regarding the rotablator wire, it is a 0.009 inch wire that ends 0.014 inch at the very tip. So as a result of that, it's very flimsy. And in addition, it has no hydrophilic coating to prevent shearing it. So it's difficult to torque and it's difficult to advance through the coronary. That's why usually we uh, wire the lesion using a workhorse wire, then we exchange for a rota wire using a micro catheter. Also, it's a long wire 325 system and the rotablator system, advancing it and removing it is an over the wire system. And I'll provide tips of how to do that efficiently. So there are two types of rota wires, the rota wire floppy and the rota wire extra support. Overwhelmingly, we use the rota wire floppy. The rota wire extra support is problematic because it can straighten the vessel and it can, the wire itself can hug and get stuck against the lesser curvature of the vessel, which can lead to uh, cutting in an eccentric fashion and causing a risk of perforation. Therefore, we usually don't use rotawire extra support except for osteo-rotablation, which I will describe later, and sometimes for distal disease where you need support to advance the rotablator system. Those are the burrs that we use in rotablation. There are different sizes, 1.25, 1 1.5, 1 1.75, 2 and above. Generally, you need 6 French uh, system, guide system for 1.25, 1.5, 7 French for 1.75, and 8 French for 2 millimeter and above. But I generally use, even for those, I try to use 7 French at least to get one more support and to be able to inject dye if needed. Note an important idea here. Note the olive-shaped 1.25 millimeter burr versus the more rounded, larger burrs. That 1.25 millimeter olive-shaped burr tend to spring forward like a bullet when you activate the knob rotablator button. And therefore it's risky because it springs forward like a bullet. It may cross the lesion without cutting it, just from that initial spring release of tension of the burr. And therefore it can get past the lesion without cutting it and it can get stuck past it. And since you cannot do backward cutting, if it springs past the lesion, the burr will be stuck. 1.5 millimeter burr is my choice in 90% of the cases. And remember, you are not sizing the burr to the vessel. You just try to sand and fracture the superficial luminal calcium. Hence, sizing the burr to half the vessel size, the vessel diameter is your target. Maximum burr to vessel ratio should be 0.6. For example, for vessels in the 2.5 to 3.5 range, I overwhelmingly use the 1.5 millimeter burr. I use the 1.75 burr for vessels around four millimeters. And I would consider the two millimeter burr for vessels larger than four millimeter. But that's rare. Again, overwhelmingly, it's a 1.5 millimeter burr. Now, when do we use the 1.25 millimeter burr? One, mainly we use it in extreme angulations where there is a higher risk of perforation with larger burrs or with lesions that cannot be crossed even with a microcatheter, those extremely tight, uncrossable lesions. We may do a step-up strategy where we start with a 1.25, then step up to 1.5 millimeter burr. We connect the Rota Pro Advancer to the console through those cables, which contain the nitrogen gas cable, uh, the fiber optic cable, and the Rota Glide flushing solution cable. 
Importantly, we run a flushing solution that contains that slippery material called rotaglide. We put with it heparin. Do not put any more nitroglycerin and verapamil. People used to put nitroglycerin and verapamil in the, in the flushing solution. And it turned out that most of the hypotension you get when you're doing rotablation is from that flush solution. And actually that was my early experience with it as well. I used to get a lot of hypotension with the rotablation and I used to think it's rotablation, but once I stopped using those, I very rarely get hypotension with the rotablation. In fact, I tend to believe that rotablation is more tolerated than balloon angioplasty in terms of hypotension. Uh, as long as you're keeping your rotablation runs brief, less than 10 to 15 seconds. And as an, ex as an extension of that point, should you use a transvenous spacing when you're doing rotablation? It is less commonly required today with a proper technique and with eliminating verapamil from the glide solution. I still use it in RCA, dominant left circumflex, or uh, any left coronary atherectomy with CTO of the RCA. Basically, the RCA is getting collateral from the left. Alternatively, because it's becoming uncommon to have a profound bradycardia with the current techniques, you may just not put a pacemaker at all, and some operators don't put a pacemaker at all. They use a standby atropine or aminophilin IV. Now, those are the steps before inserting the rotablator into the body. This is what we call the draw. Basically, you connect your advancer to the console and you start dripping that rotaglide. Then you load onto the wire and you see the wire coming out and over the wire system, you will see it coming out at the back end of that advancer. And then you test the burr and you set up the speed at let's say 155,000 RPM and you test the advancer you loosen the screw on the knob and you move back and forth and you see the burr moving back and forth. Then you lock that burr two centimeters from the end. Then you see that the wire and torquer at the back are not moving when the burr is active. And you can actually try to pull on that wire and see that when the burr is active, the wire is locked. This is what we call verifying the wire lock mechanism. So drip, Rotate after you advance the advancer over the wire and advance the burr. Then you verify the wire system as you're rotating, uh, as you're actively rotating. You can pull on the wire and see that it's not moving. I will move now to the more advanced uh, techniques. One, Understand the wire break mechanism, which is a little bit confusing in the rotation atherectomy, more confusing than it is in the CSI orbital atherectomy. What is the wire break mechanism? Each time the burr is activated, meaning each time the knob is pushed or dynaglide is activated, there is an automatic internal lock mechanism on the wire that prevents this wire from moving forward, axial movement, or spinning, rotational movement, as you are advancing the burr. This is a great, except when you want to move the whole system on Dynaglide. The wire break mechanism will make the wire move with the whole system. So you need to unbreak or defeat the break to avoid having the wire stuck on the system. And this is how you unbreak. There is a button here. This is the wire unbreak or break defeat button. And you just push it, the brake gets defeated. Now, there are more creative ways of pushing this. And here is how you do it. So the wire has a torquer on it. And you always position that torquer in a way that the tail part of the torquer is with the tail end of the wire. And what you can do, you loop the wire with, with its torquer and you dock it in this space but push the break defeat button before you dock it in this space. Once this wire uh, torquer is docked in, it will keep the button pushed and the break defeated. This is an illustration of that. So here I'm 
loading the torquer, I push the brake defeat, then I dock it in place. Again, I load the torquer, push the brake defeat, then I dock it in place, and the wire brake will remain defeated thanks to that wire torquer docked in place. This is another illustration of that. Again, tail to tail on the wire torquer, then we dock it after pushing the brake defeat. Now, here is how we activate DynaGlide. There are two ways of activating it. After brake defeating, so we push the DynaGlide, I'm defeating the brake and looping the wire, and I can activate it persistently by pushing this knob or intermittently by pushing that knob. Intermittently, persistently. And see here, when I'm active on DynaGlide or full speed, I'm not able to move the wire. I need to break the feet to be able to move the wire. See here, I cannot move the wire. Another idea is when you defeat the brake, this wire torquer will provide the extra purpose of preventing the wire from spinning. It is in fact a good habit to always keep it in the back of the wire, whether you are on DynaGlide or whether you are active rotablating or not. Second tip, so I said that Usually we wire the lesion, especially when it is a tight lesion, using a standard workhorse wire and we exchange with a microcatheter for that rota wire, that flimsy, floppy, difficult to torque wire. However, what can what to do if the your standard workhorse or polymer wire crosses the lesion, but the microcatheter cannot cross, and therefore I cannot exchange for the rota wire. So in those cases, what we do. Let's say the lesion is here and we've already crossed it with the whisper wire. So what I do, I advance a microcatheter all the way to the mouth of the lesion. I cannot, I haven't been able to advance the microcatheter all the way down, but I advance it all the way to the mouth of the lesion. Then I take this wire and I try to wire the lesion with the rota wire. Once you have a catheter just at the mouth of the lesion, usually it's easy to maneuver the rota wire through the lesion. So that's one technique. Another technique, if you have no success with that, if even by placing the microcatheter at the mouth of the lesion, you cannot wire directly with the rota wire. In that case, you may need to try laser first because laser can be advanced over any wire, including your workhorse wire. Then after you do your laser, then you may do rotablation if needed. You know, you do your laser, then you exchange for a rota wire, then you do rotablation if needed. Third tip I want to describe, a very important one, is how to advance the rotablator system over the wire into the guiding catheter. Remember, the rotablator system is an over-the-wire system. You have to advance a bulky advancer over the wire. The old fashioned way was to do it in a way that you advance the catheter while someone is holding the wire on the back, like with any over the wire system. This is not the best technique. So the way we do it these days is the following. We advance on DynaGlide. So first I will activate DynaGlide, defeat the brake, dock the wire in this place and push ongoing DynaGlide and just push the catheter under DynaGlide. See how that wire loop is growing. Nobody's holding the wire for me. The loop is growing. You need to do it under fluoro to make sure indeed the wire tip is not diving, but it usually works. One important idea is that in order to do this, you, your bird though has to be in that area, past the junction of the two way with a guiding catheter. So you have to be past you know, 10 centimeter from the two E. So here you advance it initially past the junction with the two E using standard technique with no DynaGlide and no brake defeat. Then you do the DynaGlide, brake defeat, dock it in the system, push the persistent DynaGlide and advance and you see the wire loop grow.
Another technique consists of not using Dynaglide and not using the brake defeat. It's a creative technique of doing over the wire advancement that you can use with actually any balloon over the wire system. You create a loop with the rotablator catheter and you will see here one hand advances the catheter while the other hand pulls back and you adjust how much you push with how much you pull. You use the same force to push as how much you pull. This is also a single operator technique. And since it's one operator doing it, you know how much force you're exerting to advance and how much force you're exerting to pull. And you make those two forces equal. But the best technique I think is the use of Dynaglide. Fourth tip is how to remove the rotablator from the guide over the long wire. So I explain how to advance it, now how to take it out. The standard technique is one we take, we always take it out under, under Dynaglide. Okay, that's, there is no argument about that. We take the system out under Dynaglide. Now, one way of taking it out under Dynaglide is to do the old fashioned way is that you activate Dynaglide, then you push the wire while pulling the system. Unlike other over the wire systems, you really need to push the wire. You don't just spin the wire and pull the catheter. You need to push the wire while pinning the catheter. It's hard to keep that wire in place. If you just pin and pull, you'll end up pulling the wire. You have to push the wire while pulling on the catheter. And this is an illustration of that. So Dynaglide and brake defeat, and I activate it with this button. So here again, Dynaglide, I brake defeat and I activate. So I have two fingers, one on the brake defeat, one on the Dynaglide activation, and I'm taking it out. You can activate Dynaglide with this, but for that maneuver, it's easier to push here. Another way of doing the same thing is to defeat the brake using the wire loop and wire torquer, docking it into the space. And here we wire looped and docked it the torque in this space, and we're practically doing the same thing, except just the wire is docked in this place. Now, the second big technique of taking the uh, rotablator out is what I call the single position technique. So unlike those where you're pushing the wire and pulling the catheter, and you're moving your body, this technique, you stay in place. And this technique is effective usually after pulling the burr into the descending aorta and after having some slack on that burr catheter, okay? So you have to open the TUI fully and what you do in place, you don't pull the advancer, you just push the wire, you just push the wire and the whole system will come out. See, I'm pushing the wire here and the catheter loop is growing, telling me that this catheter is coming out. And I didn't pull on that advancer system. All I did is I just push on the wire. Again, for this to succeed, you have to have the TUI widely open, whether someone opens it for you or you're using something that you can keep all open. Um, and a two, you need to have some slack. So you need to have pulled the rotablator uh, burr back into the descending aorta, probably 20 centimeters or so, or so, okay? Again, with all those, watch your wire tip under fluoro. Now, those are live in a patient using that second technique, that single position technique. So watch here. So the operator is just pushing the wire and the catheter is coming out and its loop is growing. It's just pushing, no pulling on the catheter. Again, here you see, he's just pushing the wire and the catheter loop keeps growing as it's getting kicked out of the, the guiding catheter. And you will see it here come out. Just remember, as you're doing all those maneuvers, it can get confusing. When do I defeat the brake? When do I loosen the burr knob? Just always remember this. Do I need to defeat the brake 
Yes, if I'm moving the whole advancer system while the bird is active. If the bird is not active and you're pulling or pushing the system, you do not need to defeat the break. So if you're pushing or pulling the whole advancer system without, dyna without dynaglide, you do not need to defeat the break. Okay? Only if you're moving it on dynaglide, you need to defeat the break. And most of what I've shown, what I've shown here was movement on dynaglide. That's why grossly most of the time when we're moving the whole system, we need to defeat the break. Now, fifth tip. Once you get close to the tip of the guide, or let's say once you get into the ascending aorta with your burr inside the guide, how to get that burr into the ostial coronary? So as I explained, you advance the whole thing using Dynaglide as a single operator technique. So you keep going with that same thing under Dynaglide all the way to the tip of the guide. However, if you were advancing using a standard old fashioned technique while someone is holding the wire or you're holding the wire and you're advancing the a catheter without Dynaglide, even if you're using that old fashioned technique, you need to activate the Dynaglide once you get in this portion of the catheter, or it's preferred that you activate Dynaglide once, in, once you're in the this portion of the guiding catheter, because this will prevent resistance to advancing the burr inside the guide, and it will prevent kicking the guide out of the coronary. It will prevent straightening the guide as you're advancing the burr and kicking the guide out of the coronary. Uh, it will also allow you to release some of the tension in the system that you're getting as you're advancing the system through the tortuosity inside the aorta. Okay, now the sixth tip, once you're in the coronary, how to release the tension of the burr. The idea here is that the locked burr that is advanced through the bands of the aorta and the guide has a stored tension and torque in it. Once you activate that burr to 150, 160,000 RPM, all this tension will be released and the burr will abruptly jump and may jump past your lesion without cutting it, creating a risk of a burr getting stuck as you cannot cut backward. So you need to release the burr tension proximal to the lesion before you activate and start cutting the lesion. So you position yourself several centimeters proximal, proximal to the lesion and you start releasing the tension several centimeters before the lesion. And this is how you release the tension. There are three techniques and you need to do all three, especially that number three. So one, I mentioned that we, ad we advanced the whole rotablator system while the burr is locked at the back of the advancer. Okay, so what you do, you unscrew it and you move it back and forth a couple of centimeter back and forth that will take some of the tension away two you can grab the catheter the burr catheter close to the tui and gently advance it and retract it a centimeter back and forth that will also release some of the tension three you can activate briefly dynaglide without moving the bar just in place, push the Dynaglide, that will take the tension away. Again, if you've used Dynaglide to get through the guide catheter, especially the last portion of the guide catheter, then that will have taken also some of the tension away. But regardless, proximal to the lesion, activate briefly Dynaglide without moving the bar. This will take the tension away at lower speed and will cause less of a jump. This is an illustration of those three steps. So one, um, I unscrewed the knob and I move it back and forth. I'm moving the catheter back and forth at the TUI. Then I push the Dynaglide enabling button and I activated the Dynaglide in place. Okay. So once you're in the coronary, I explained how to release the tension and start rotablating a proximal lesion. Now, how about if you want to rotablate a mid-vessel lesion? How to get that rotablator burr all the way to the mid-vessel? It's not easy to get that burr 
catheter all the way to the mid vessel across some tortuosity and bends. So one way is to just, someone is holding the wire, pinning the wire, and you advance the catheter uh, without a break defeat and without dynaglide while the knob is locked. So that's one way of doing it. But the better way is to advance the whole system with dynaglide while the knob is locked and while the wire is unbreaking. Okay, that's the best technique. Now, if lesion is close to the guide, as I described earlier, may just advance the whole system without dynaglide. But when it is mid-vessel, use dynaglide to advance it. The dynaglide is not going to create injury through that a portion of the coronary that you're passing through, and it will allow you to slip without getting stuck. Every time you want to advance the whole system, your knob should be locked. It is unlocked only during active rotablation. This is an illustration of how to advance to a mid-vessel lesion with dynaglide. So again, we uh, break defeat. We use the break defeat mechanism using, in this case, docking the torquer. Then we push dynaglide. Then my assistant here will push the dynaglide button, the intermittent dynaglide button, and so that we stop as soon as we reach the area that we need to reach. I don't like to use this button to activate dynaglide in this situation because as I'm advancing, if I have issues advancing or the bird is getting stuck somewhere, I want to immediately be able to stop uh, the dynaglide. Now, eighth step, a very important step, how to burr across the lesion. What is the technique to burr across the lesion? So it's the pecking technique. Let's say this is our lesion. One, I try to never penetrate it in one shot. I try to peck at the lesion. So I touch it off and on without any heavy push, without any stall. Burr should never remain in one place. It's constant moving, slow in, fast out. You're not cutting backward. So there is no point of going slow backward. You go slow in, fast backward. And you never stall. It's always in and out. Slow in, fast out. It's You limit to three, four centimeters per pass. And you always finish proximal to the lesion. You don't finish your burning in the middle of the lesion. You go in, you go back out, and you finish your run proximal. You keep your runs brief, less than 10 to 15 seconds. No more than 20, but especially 10 to 15 seconds the first two, three runs. You avoid decelerations more than 5,000 RPM. And you take a break of at least 30 seconds, typically one to two minutes between runs so that you clear the microemboli between runs. Don't try to penetrate the whole lesion in one pass, in my opinion you will generate too much heat and too much microemboli. Penetrate the lesion progressively, more and more with every pass, as I'm showing here. The first pass, 10 to 15 seconds, we're packing at this portion of the lesion. The second pass, we're packing all the way to the middle of it. Third pass, three quarter, fourth pass, we cross it. The, the more eccentric the lesion, the more angulated the lesion is, the more you have to be careful. It may take you four or five passes before you fully cross the lesion. Patience is a virtue in those cases. So take your time, no need to rush and keep the runs brief and take uh, breaks between runs. The idea here for the breaks is that with rotablation, you embolize small particles that are less than five microns, smaller than the right blood cells, and those particles are drained by the microcirculations because they are very small. Uh, it's like throwing particles of sands into a drain. A handful of sand is not going to plug your drain, but if you pour a whole bucket of sand, it will clog your, your drain. That is why we keep our runs short to minimize the number of microemboli, not the size, the number of microemboli, and we give time in between 
for the microcirculation to clear that sand that we threw at the microcirculation. Another idea, very important uh, and maybe relevant when you're doing mid-vessel or distal vessel rotablation, be careful. If this is the burr and this blue thing here is the wire, be careful. Do not come close with your burr to the radio-opaque portion of the wire. The radio-opaque portion of the wire is 0.014, while this portion is 0.09. So what will happen if your burr hits that 0.014, it will shear it, it will rip it apart. So do not come close, stay at least three, four centi three centimeters away from that uh, radio opaque portion of the wire. So I explained earlier, birth to RTA ratio is a 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 range. And I explained that I overwhelmingly use a 1.5 millimeter burr. A step burr strategy beginning with a 1.5 millimeter burr may be considered in cases for which a micro exchange catheter will not cross. Those are the uncrossable lesions. And for lesions with severe angulation, tortuosity or eccentricity where you have a higher risk of perforation with a larger burr. So you may start with that smaller burr, keeping in mind the higher risk of burr getting stuck. So the smaller burr may cross more easily uh, those, those lesions that are uncrossable and may have lesser risk of perforation in those severe angulation, but it has a higher chance of getting stuck. So you have to be extremely careful in releasing the tension before you start uh, rotablation using the 1.25 millimeter burr and release the tension several centimeters proximal to the lesion to avoid the burr from flying and springing past the lesion and getting stuck like a bullet past it. Now, in cases where you start 1.5 and you don't manage to cross the lesion after four or five passes, you can downsize to 1.25, especially also if, the, if the, with the 1.5, you start getting excessive decelerations. On the other hand, if you start with a 1.5 burr, but uh, even after 1.5 burr, the lesion remains undilated, your balloon still doesn't yield after 1.5 burr, then you can upsize the burr uh, in this case and use 1.75 burr after your initial smaller burr. This is an illustration of how I do the rotablation. So slow in, pass out, slow in, pass out. And usually I keep it three, four centimeter at, the, at a time, less than 15 seconds. So you unscrew it, activate, slow in, Back, fast back out. In my experience, using brief runs with only gradual lesion penetration and with no deceleration and with breaks over a minute between runs, rotablation is at least as well tolerated and maybe even better tolerated than balloon angioplasty. This is an illustration of a case. This is a very eccentric LAD stenosis. We were worried, again, when it's eccentric, the rotablation burr uh, may be cutting part of the normal or less diseased vessel, the eccentric part of the vessel that is less diseased and may cause a perforation. So it's extremely important here to not cross that lesion in one pass. It took me five passes to pass this, that lesion on purpose. So see here, I'm just pecking at the lesion, slow in, faster out, slow in, faster out. And I, I again, I didn't aim, I didn't try to cross it. I just wanted to caress it. I try not to stall. I try to keep moving. Then in the second pass, I advanced furthermore inside that lesion. Maybe the first time I was here, the second time I was there. And finally, on the fifth pass, I decided to cross it and here I cross it and it went safely. This patient had no, no reflow and no complications. The heaviest calcium is in the proximal cap. So that's why I try not to penetrate it on the first run. I keep pecking at it with total runs less than 15 seconds without fully penetrating it. Additional technical tip. Let's say the rota wire needs repositioning. For example, you need to re-advance it, but you are unable to move it by just push and pull through the rotablator advancer. What is the next step? 
The best step here is to activate the Dynaglide with a brake defeat and then move your wire. Activating the Dynaglide will allow smoother repositioning of the rotor wire. Dynaglide will lessen the tension over the wire and will allow you to be able to torque it and move it in or move it out. Ninth tip, how to rotablate aortoosteal lesions. So one, you have to disengage your guiding catheter slightly until you are no longer ventricularized. Then you start rotablating inside the guide. Don't worry about activating the uh, rotablation bar inside the guide. So you start rotablating from inside the guide all the way into the coronary. This way you make sure you've nailed that very ostium. For those procedures, I use the rota extra support. That's about one of the few times I use the rota extra support in instead of the rota floppy. If you use the rota wire floppy, it may twirl in the aorta. So you want that rota support to, prov to provide a good drill from the aorta into the coronary. This is an illustration of an osseal disease. And you can see here, so we're starting to activate inside the guide. And we're going from the guide into the coronary and we're pecking at it progressively. Eventually we crossed. This wasn't our first run, by the way. Now, how to advance the system to a distal lesion? You want to do rotablation of a distal lesion. Well, one, one, my first advice to you is avoid rotablation of distal disease. If you want to get in trouble, you do rotablation of distal disease. This is where you get burr entrapment or uh, where you can get perforation. So my advice is avoid distal disease. But if nonetheless you want to do distal disease, you have to be experienced. And there are three techniques of rotablating distal disease. One, like I explained earlier, you advance the whole system under Dynaglide into the distal lesion. So here, we're advancing under Dynaglide close to the distal lesion. So that's one technique, like you do when you're advancing it to a mid vessel lesion. If Dynaglide does not succeed because of proximal severe calcific disease, so in that case, the way you can get to the distal lesion is to rotablate the proximal disease. So let's say I want to rotablate this distal lesion, okay? And I'm not able to cross this system with Dynaglide into here because there is a lot of heavy calcium proximally. So the way you do, you rotablate the proximal disease, multiple runs. Then on the very last run, after rotablating that proximal disease, you position the burr close to the distal lesion. Then you keep your knob loose, unscrewed, and you advance the whole system and you will see that knob move backward, okay? So once you've positioned your bar, you, so basically you do a rotablation multiple times approximal to the lesion, then you position on the last run, you position your bar distally before the distal lesion, and then you slide the whole advancer system over it. You push it, so the bar is distally, you loosen, you unscrew, and you advance the whole advancer system over it. You will see the burr knob progressively go backward as the advancer sheath is going forward over the anchored burr. The advancer is sliding over that anchored burr. Now the whole system burr and drive shaft are distal and you have more reach. And this is by the way, the only time you advance the whole system while the knob is loose. Normally, like I explained earlier, always we advance the whole system while the knob is tight. You only loosen it in this particular case. The third technique is to advance a guide liner distally, at least a seven French guide liner, put it distally so that you advance the burr distally through it. So we advance the guide liner distally, but you position it proximal to the lesion. Then you advance the burr through the guide liner. And this way you won't have to cross all the proximal calcium before your distal lesion. 
But again, my advice, avoid this sort of ablation, high risk of birth stock. And if done, consider using seven, eight French guidelines stationed distally to reduce the risk of birth entrapment. That technique, C. Along those lines, another idea in rotablation in general is when you have a proximal and a distal disease, you rotablate and finish polishing the proximal disease first, then you advance your whole advancer and rotablate the distal disease. So unlike with stenting, where you stand distally, then stand proximally, typically with rotablation, you rotablate proximally, finish polishing proximally, then you move on and you move your whole advancer system distally and you start rotablating distally. Now, 11th tip, how to treat osteal left circumflex at a 90 degree angle. So take this patient. He has a 90% calcified osteal left circumflex, but it's coming at a 90 degree angle. The highest risk of complication with rotablator is when you're performing it across severely tortuous or angled segment, when your lesion is at a 90 degree angle. It's a, it used to be a relative contraindication. It isn't. We do it. But there are particular precautions you need to follow. So in order to do rotablation at a 90 degree angle, you have to basically annihilate and eliminate that angle. And the way you do that, two ways. If your left main is short, you advance your guide all the way through the left main onto the mouth of the left circumflex. And you basically make your guide in line with the lesion so that you avoid rotablation at a sharp angle. Now, if your left main is long, you cannot advance the guide so deep. So what you use, you use an eight French guide liner. Seven French can work, but best use eight French guide with an eight French guide liner. Advance your eight French guide liner deep in the left main and position it at the mouth of the left circumflex, making it in line with that osteum and again, eliminating the 90 degree angle. Then you start rotablating from inside the guide liner all the way into the circumflex osteal stenosis. And that's kind of what we did here. We advanced the left main deep. You see there, is, there isn't much of an angle anymore. And here we see when we crossed. Okay, we're pecking at it and we crossed it. It isn't 90 degree angle anymore. We kept the guide close to the lesion to eliminate that 90 degree angle as in this here. An important thing also, when you're doing those angled and tortuous vessel, high risk of perforation, again, key is to do short runs and not try to cross that lesion in one shot. We cross this lesion after at the fifth pass. So take your time. Now, 12th tip, how to treat burr entrapment. There are Two major dreaded complications with rotablation, large vessel perforation and burr entrapment. There are other per complications such as dissection and no reflow, but those are easy to deal with. The complication I will discuss here is burr entrapment. Let's say we got that burr entrapped past the lesion, okay, whether because you didn't release tension and when you activate it, it sprung past the lesion and it got stuck there maybe 1.25 burr, so it did get stuck past the lesion. How do you relieve burr entrapment? There are some simple things you can try. There is one best answer, but there are some simple things you can try before. You can try to give vasodilator. You can try to activate the burr to 180 or 200 uh, thousands for one second, then try to pull hard. Uh, the traditional answer is you ad but that's not the correct answer in my opinion. The traditional answer is you advance a wire and a balloon next to that stuck burr and you balloon next to it so that you can release it and you pull it out. But the, the burr is getting stuck against an extremely tight and calcified lesion. How can you imagine advancing another wire next to it and worse, another balloon? So it's almost impossible to advance a wire and balloon across such a tight calcified space where the burr is stuck. Second, there is no room inside your guide to advance 
a balloon and a wire. There is only room usually for that rotablator bar. So in order to do that wire and balloon, you have to place a second guide, a ping pong guide, and do double engagement with another guide and do that. But that's not a good technique. The single best technique is guideliner. That's the answer, guideliner. You advance a guideliner. Let's say this is uh, a seven French system. You advance a seven French guideliner and you pull the bar inside it. You advance it deep, close to the bar and you pull the bar inside it. The, the bar that is being stuck will provide a good rail for you to advance the guideliner distally. Then you can pull hard on it and get it in the guideliner. However, how do you advance a guideliner once the bar is in place? You can advance a bar through a guideliner once a guideliner is in, is in place. But when a bar is in place, you cannot in a straightforward fashion advance a guideliner over it. So there is a technique to do that. The idea here is, you see you have, an, you have a catheter and an advancer and you cannot advance a guideliner over that. So you have to cut that uh, catheter from the advancer system and you take the Teflon sheath that is over the bar catheter, you take it out so that will create more room, then you advance the guideliner over that, okay? You may not need to remove the Teflon sheath uh, if you're using a seven French guideliner. A seven French guideliner will fill the catheter and the Teflon sheath but you need to take out the Teflon sheath with six French guideliner and you know, why not take it out anyway? So you need to cut this and advance the guideliner over the system often with taking out also the Teflon sheath of the burr. And then you advance it over the burr catheter, the guideliner. Now, final section number 13 is a brief on orbital atherectomy and the differences between orbital atherectomy and a rotational atherectomy. So orbital atherectomy, look at, look at the catheter here. The burr is positioned eccentrically and orbitates eccentrically. Unlike the rotablator burr, which is located centrally and rotates centrally, the rotablator burr will only shave its diameter. So you have 1.5 millimeter burr, it will shave at the 1.5 millimeter diameter. Conversely, the, rotable, the, the rotational atherectomy bar orbitates eccentrically to a distance larger than the bar size. Hence, the orbital coronary orbital atherectomy only comes in one size, 1.25 millimeters, because you can make it orbitate to 1.85 millimeters. Another difference with the rotational atherectomy is that note the bar Unlike the burr of the rotational atherectomy, there is a nose cone past it. You see this? There is a nose cone past it. So which means this is where you cut or send the lesion, meaning you have to cross the lesion with this whole thing before you can send it. Unlike the rotablator where the burr is at the very end of the catheter, there is nothing past it. So you have the burr and immediately past it the wire. So you can just touch the lesion and cut it directly with the burr. There is nothing that you need to cross the lesion with before except the wire. Whereas with the orbital atherectomy, there is five plus millimeter of tube that needs to cross the lesion before you can start cutting and sending it. And that's a major downside for uncrossable lesions. You're not going to be able to do CSI because you're not going to be able to cross it with this a portion of the CSI catheter, okay? Now, in terms of burr, I mentioned it's only one size for the coronaries, 1.25 millimeter, and there are two speeds, 80K and 120K, unlike the 140 to 160K that we use in a rotational atherectomy. Another important difference is the burr has both frontal and backward cutting. So you have less risk of the burr getting stuck because it's cutting in both ways, frontal and backward. And here you see the eccentric sending of the orbital atherectomy. So it doesn't stay in the center, it orbitates. And the higher the speed, the more it orbitates, the further away it orbitates. So this is the equation that shows you what's the centrifugal force 
on that bar. The force that throws it is centrically. It depends on the speed. The faster the speed, the further away it orbitates. Another very important idea is that not just the faster, the faster the speed, the more you orbitate. So 120, you orbitate more than 80. But in reality, and more importantly, the slower you move it forward, the further out you orbitate. It's even more important for the orbital mechanism than for the rotational mechanism to move slowly one millimeter per second. With the orbital mechanism, if you move the burr fast, as in here, the green, the burr will spring and orbitate forward and less so sideways. It will orbitate, it will jump and orbitate forward and a lot of its energy will be spent forward rather than sideways. So moving slowly will create a larger spiral and larger eccentric cutting. Even with 80,000 speed, if you move slowly, you're going to get a lot more orbital gain and larger diameter cutting than if you use 120,000 at a fast rate. Therefore, it's best to only use 80K and use one millimeter per second. And you can get to 1.75 millimeter diameter after five passes at a slow pace, okay? In fact, you should often try to avoid the 120K. It's been shown that with CSI, orbital atherectomy, most of your complications such as perforation occur with the higher speeds. This is the orbital atherectomy uh, advancer system, catheter and advancer system. It's grossly similar to the rotational atherectomy. It has a knob that you screw and unscrew. It has here buttons for the 80K and 120K. And it has also something that they call a glide assist, which is kind of similar to DynaGlide, except the speed is 5K. And you can use that glide assist to advance and withdraw the system as it is with the rotational atherectomy. Now, what are the pro and cons of orbital atherectomy versus rotational atherectomy? Uh, orbital atherectomy has some advantages. It's six French for all vessels, okay? Because again, you can get up to 1.85 millimeters uh, with the 1.25 millimeter bar, which goes into the six French uh, guide catheter. It has forward and backward cutting, so less risk of burr entrapment. If your burr jumps past the lesion, well, you're going to cut it on the way back. So less risk of burr entrapment. And it is important in uh, orbital atherectomy to use a slow forward and slow backward movement. In rotation atherectomy, I use slow forward, fast backward movement. With this, use a slow forward and slow backward movement. Same thing, keep the, your runs 10 to 15 seconds. Now, uh, another advantage is that you have better guide wire. The guide wire of CSI is 0.012 inch body instead of 0.09 inch body. The tip is the same, 0.014 inch. But the fact that you have a bigger body and it's better design, it's actually easier to torque and easier to wire with it. And it may be used more readily as a primary wire. Another advantage is that because the catheter is uh, smaller and it fits in six French guide catheter, you may use a trapper. If you're using seven French guide, you may use a trapper to advance and withdraw the CSI, which is something you cannot do with rotational atherectomy as the space is too tight for you to fit a trapper. Another advantage is a simpler break defeat mechanism. So they have a break defeat mechanism here, but it's simpler. Anytime you're advancing the whole system, you need to defeat the break. And anytime you activate the burr, you need to put the brake on. So you put the brake on when you activate the burr, when you're basically cutting, and you release brake when you're moving the, the catheter in and out, whether you're on glide assist or you're not. So it's easier to understand that system. Another questionable advantage this time is less no reflow, less need for pacing. Uh, this may not be true in the current era with the proper rotablator techniques.
tons of orbital atherectomy. It has a nose cone in front of the bar. So if lesion is uncrossable with microcatheter, CSI nose cone will not cross. This is the uh, one of the biggest downside. The second big downside is severely angled or tortuous or eccentric lesions. So you should avoid CSI in severely angled or tortuous or eccentric lesions. Whereas you can do carefully rotablation. You cannot do CSI. CSI creates deeper cut than rotablation and may orbitate excessively at a band and excessively at a wire bias location where the wire is hugging the wall. Therefore, CSI creates more dissection, deeper dissection, and more perforations in severely angled or eccentric lesions compared to rotablator. Also, CSI should be avoided in vessel less than 2.5 millimeter, again, because it orbitates deeply and it creates a higher risk of perforation in those small vessels. This is a study that showed that you get higher dissection and perforation rates with orbital atherectomy, particularly if you're using the 120K. If you want to be safe, you're using it in cases where there is some angulation and tortuosity, don't go more than 80K and stay slow with short runs. This is another study. It's an OCT study. It shows that the orbital atherectomy dissections were significantly deeper than rotational atherectomy dissection. You create deeper cuts lacuna with orbital atherectomy than with rotational atherectomy. This is a great if you want to achieve better stent expansion in large vessels such as a left main, but it's not good for sharp angles and for small vessels. So to give you the bottom line myself, I prefer generally the uh, rotational atherectomy. Orbital atherectomy has some advantages, but it has two disadvantages, I think, that keeps me away from it. One of the advantages of orbital atherectomy is left main. You can use six French orbital atherectomy in a large left main. So this is one place where you can use it and where using orbital atherectomy may be advantageous, especially distal left main. Now, how about the question that comes out frequently is how do you do orbital atherectomy of aorto-osteal disease? You don't want to do like I do with rotablation. So with rotablation, I said we disengage the guide and we start activating the burr inside the guide and we cut all the way from inside the guide through the aorta into the ostium. You don't want to do that with orbital atherectomy because it orbitates. So if you let it go in the aorta, it may orbitate excessively and dissect the aorta. So with orbital atherectomy, you can cut the ostium, but not forward, backward. So what you do, the, it, you do the opposite of rotational atherectomy. You deeply engage the guide. Then you advance the burr past the lesion. And then you disengage the guide here. And you activate the burr and you cut backward the ostium. Then, once you're back in the guide, you can do the same thing again. Readvance the guide, readvance the burr, disengage the guide, cut backward. This is an illustration uh, of a patient where he had a mid LAD stenosis. He also had osseous stenosis on another view. We use CSI in this patient, and the way it was done, CSI was advanced while the guide is engaged, CSI of the LAD was done. Then, we disengage the guide and CSI was pulled back slowly to cut the ostium while the guide is disengaged. Then you can re-engage the guide, advance the burr, then disengage the guide and cut back slowly again on the way back. 